Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros Podcast. Look, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a crazy thing, Dan, that we're able to do this show, uh, talk about people we admire, and then uh, a few weeks later, we're able to actually get them on air. Who do we have today, D'Anthony? Uh, we have Sergeant Kevin Briggs from the California Highway Patrol. Correct. And you made him drinking bro of the week a few weeks back. It was about three weeks ago, I think, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, s- September is Suicide Awareness Month, um, and that's something that really hits home in our community, specifically the veteran and first responder community. And uh, this guy is known as the guardian of the Golden Gate Bridge. And that's because he's personally interdicted probably, what, 200 or so uh, people trying to commit suicide on the Golden Gate Bridge and stop that from happening. Really? 200? Well, I, I never counted. But I will tell you, I averaged four to six a month for about 10 years. Man, the the wildest thing to me is, so I watched the documentary. I don't know if you got a chance to see it um, about uh, how many people commit suicide uh, off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, They left cameras running for- It's called the bridge, yeah. Yeah. Uh, How long were they running cameras for, a month? I I don't know. I think it was a couple of months, probably. Yeah. So you're probably in that and don't even know it, to be honest. Uh, Actually, I was working a swing shift, so most of their stuff was done during the day Mm, day, day shift hours. And I'm glad I wasn't. uh, I'm not a big fan of that show. Um, for a lot of reasons, but I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, they're kind of capitalizing on the, on the tragedy. Precisely. I've met the producers and, and the whole thing. And I will tell you, uh, after that show came out, suicides on the bridge went up dramatically. Really? Yeah. We have to be very careful about how we talk about mm-hmm. suicides in this country. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's what's that, what's that old saying? Psychology is more, uh, viral than the flu or something like that. Uh, right. Yeah, it's right. a it's a big deal when it when it becomes normalized, when it becomes a thing to do, people do it for essentially clout. It's not like really like clout, like internet clout or anything, mm-hmm. but it is a way to get recognized and noticed and do something that is in the mainstream. It becomes normalized at that point. So I agree with you. It's definitely important to talk about it. Sure. In the right way. Um, do you remember your first uh, person you talked down? I do, and and I will tell you, uh, as a fairly new officer, I had no training in this. Didn't know what I was doing. We are trained as uh, law enforcement to go in and handle situations, calm the chaos. But in this, you know, I walked right up to her and, and part of me was thinking, okay, she's going to jump. This is a suicide. The other part of me is, is this a trespasser? Is this some kind of taking a picture? Is this a joke? So I didn't really know what I was walking up into. Like I said, man, I had no training. Uh, it, was, it was terrible. Uh, but I, I went off of empathy. And mm. there was a younger woman over the rail. The rail is only four foot tall. She's standing on an eye beam over on the other side, and then it's just a one step and 220 feet down. But I spoke with her for, oh, half an hour or so, and she did come back over. But I think she had a lot of empathy for me. You can see that, that uh, man, this guy, he's, he's scared, and he really doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Yeah, I, I'm always curious as to where you start a conversation uh, like that. When you know something so immediate could happen, uh, I would, I would be nervous trying to find the words of, because I'm, I'm sure the first two or three sentences are the ones that it's either, you know, they're going or they're not going. And then you're able to reel them in and have a conversation. Exactly. And that's what we're looking for, to be able to develop some rapport. When I'm out there on these types of incidents, they see the uniform. What I do is I kind of stay back a little bit and I just raise my hand, open handed and say, hey. I'm Kevin. I'm going to personalize everything. And you say, hey, I'm Kevin. Is it okay if I come up and talk with you for a while? So I think by empowering them, giving them that option right from the start, it, it starts it off on a good note. That's interesting. I, I never would have thought of that, actually, to introduce myself first. Well, I mean, it's hostage negotiation, essentially. Like, that's the same principle as hostage negotiation. You don't want to, you don't want to appear uh, as a threat to somebody, and you don't want to appear like you're trying to control them or make them do something they don't want to do, ever. Like but you it, want to give them options at that point, right? To, sure. To, like there are options other than what you're trying to do right now. Here are the options. Pick one of these. And, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously there's some situations where you just have to go grab somebody and yank their ass out of the way. Like if somebody's standing in front of a train, I think we saw a cop or, or some c- civilian do that a couple of months ago or something. I don't remember what the situation was, but somebody was trying to suicide by train or some shit. Right. And somebody yanked them out of the way. Um, there are some instances like that for the most part. 
when it when the transition from the ideation phase to the action phase of the suicidal uh, gesture stuff happens, that's the point of interdiction, and that's where that's probably why you've been so successful because you understood that from the very beginning. Well, and there's another part to this is, to me, having done a, a number of these things, it is so important that yeah, maybe I can grab that individual. I'm close enough to grab them, and maybe we can work on getting them back over. But then what? I'm trying to think long term here also. If I can get them to come back over voluntarily on their own, man, we made, you know, that's a huge success because then that shows that they want to live. So that's right. what I try to do. I typically don't grab people. I've seen it done. It, it can work. Yes. But to me, it's so important because I think it takes a lot of courage to go over that rail at the beginning. Imagine how much courage it takes to come back over that rail and start this other life. You know, it's kind of a rebirth. So imagine the courage it takes to do that. Now, if you have the courage to come back over that rail, I think you have the courage to face life again. And that's what I'm looking for. With, with the 200 or so people that you've saved, um, have any of them come back to you and thanked you years later and said, look, I turned my life around. Uh, I owe you a great debt of, of, of gratitude. Um, you, you changed my life, literally. Since this all started with me retiring and doing these types of things, I have received a couple of emails from folks. Um, but mind you, I didn't keep records on the people. We keep records in the highway patrol. But this was over you know, a good 10 years or so where I did these. Uh, one individual I do keep in contact with, and there's a, a photo of him over the rail, and he and I do speak together. So it's been really cool. But for the, for the mass majority, I don't reach out and contact them. They haven't reached out and contact me. I wish them the very best. Uh, I wouldn't know what to say if I reached out, and, and nor do I have a reason to. I say, hey, remember me? I, I saved you. And for one, I don't like that term saved. I think I was there on a, on a very dark day for these people. Yeah, not, but, not so much uh, you reaching out to them, but them reaching out to you as to say thank you. And I think the reason why I bring that up, especially in today's world, no one is thanking police officers for anything these days. Um, and uh, I, I just wondered if, you know, when something like that happens and you are this close to killing yourself, um, to come back from that, if it was one person that, that had saved me, I would thank them till the end of time of like, hey, my first child was born. I never would have got to see this if it weren't for you. Uh, hey, I got to see, you know, my daughter get married or, you know, th things like that. Um, and, and that's what I was kind of curious about. Yeah, it generally doesn't happen. And I totally hear you about the morale. I just spoke mm -hmm. with a larger agency um, up north of me uh, yesterday with a gentleman who I'm going to do some work with for negotiators. And he said their department is at an all-time low for morale, not because of management, but because of what's going on in the world. So you're exactly right. We, we got to pick these guys up. You know, they got a tough job. Yeah, and it's, again, saving someone's life is such a huge deal. If you can't get thanked for that, what can you get thanked well, for as a I police officer? Like, I just... From my perspective, when, whenever we would come back from deployments or whatever it was or go to events, people, did, and then afterwards, you know, when people find out that you did stuff, and this is more prevalent just after the Iraq war died down and not so much now, but people would thank you for your service. I'm like, all you have to do to thank me is live a life worth fighting for. That's it. And I think people, like police officers, yeah, you need a pat, everybody needs a pat on the back sometimes for sure. Like it's, it's good for your psychology to know that you're doing a good job and that people, the people that you're serving think you're doing a good job, mm -hmm. which by the way, most people, statistically speaking, all the polling shows that the vast majority of people think that cops are doing the right thing most of the time and doing a good job, by the way. Anyways, uh, I think, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's difficult. Maybe he's like, maybe he reminds them of that day and they don't want to think about that shit anymore. That's the old person. And now the new person just exists. It's like, a, like he said, a rebirth. I think that's probably part of it. Or, or embarrassment. Now that we're talking about it, um, I, I think you're right. I think there's probably some embarrassment and shame that comes with it of, I, w I was the person that was trying to kill myself and how ridiculous that was. So um, yeah, it makes sense talking about it out loud. And, and that's why we wanted to have you on today uh, yeah. was to talk well, about all of this stuff out loud, because these are conversations that nobody really has. Mm. Right. And I don't want to be a trigger, whether that sight, smell, sound, whatever that may be. So if they're doing good, man, fantastic. Glad to hear it. You know, um, we did our job that day. Hopefully we get them to someone who can help them more and, and for a longer period, you know, a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. So 
it, it's fantastic. We get that that satisfaction of not only job satisfaction, but just being a human, human to human, helping out satisfaction, and and that's what counts for us. Yeah, I think that's lost on a lot of people. The idea yeah. that soldiers and and police officers are are not normal human beings in a very abnormal position. You know what I mean? Like it's the idea of having to be armed in public and make a decision whether to shoot or not in less than one second is that is a, a lot of stress and a lot of people, especially in these high, like high to high intensity drug trafficking areas and, and the major cities face that on a daily, if not weekly or weekly, if not daily basis in a lot of these places, right? The constant stress and anxiety. It's not that we've talked about this with post-traumatic stress before. It's not just the single events that happen that cause post-traumatic stress. Now, there are some cases that would like with sexual assault and things, but for military people and police officers, typically speaking, it's the long, ex, long-term exposure to heightened uh, stress, right? Mm-hmm. That's what causes true post-traumatic stress in our communities for the most part. And that's like the, just the idea of that calls into question like how we should be treating these people. You know what I mean? Like if you have, if you have a really high performance engine, for example, you keep it oiled, use the right kind of fuel, you clean it on a regular basis. Like these people have, have sacrificed a lot and volunteered to be tools to keep our community safe. And we treat them like shit for the most part. We treat them like they're our used stuff, not our new stuff. And that's a, that's a big fucking problem for me and for a lot of people out there. And I think you're starting to see a lot of blowback with this anti-police sentiment. People are getting pissed off about it now. You know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> Case in point, it happened today with, because uh, there's, there's been a lot of celebrities that have been speaking out. Uh, defund the police, which is obviously the worst idea of all time. Um, one of the biggest champions of that in the celebrity world was Alyssa Milano. Uh, Alyssa Milano had some problems today at her house, and she called 911, and there was about 30 police officers that showed up to help her today. I'm wondering if she'll post about that tomorrow. Um, this, this idea that the police are, uh, bad in some way, uh, has gotten absolutely crazy to me. Um, I don't know if you still follow it, uh, as closely since you're out. Uh, do you, do you read the press uh, about the police every day, the, the same way you used to, or, you know, I see it and I talk to the folks who are on the job nowadays and I, and I hear about it. They go to coffee shops and somebody will buy them a coffee say, Hey, thank you very much. But on the other hand, Man, somebody may spit in their coffee. So, you know, things that you never heard of 20, 30 years ago. Um, this is a tough time. People can be very, very ruthless and brutal out there. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do as a society. We really do. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, speaking of, of which today, they're uh, barricading the city of uh, Louisville. Yeah. Um, the, the uh, I guess, the, I, I don't want to call it a verdict, but... Uh, uh, it's a grand jury verdict. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's coming down for the Brianna Taylor mm-hmm. uh, case that's been, um, you know, widely publicized in the media. Uh, and clearly, if they're putting up barricades in front of businesses, uh, they're expecting the worst tonight. Yeah. So yeah, I would. I mean, they're they're certainly. It seems like the officers are not going to be charged. Otherwise, they wouldn't be taking all of these uh, precautions. One would think, right? Right. right. But who it, who knows? We'll, we'll we'll see when we see. I guess. But it, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be nuts up there. Yeah. And everywhere, probably. Now they're even preparing out here, out in California for that. I talked with some folks yesterday. Yep. You know, these things are nationwide now uh, with, this, with the news media going on. And, and do we even know what's real going on out there? Yeah, because, uh, you know, on Twitter, you know, that's uh, obviously very popular to post. Hey, let's go protest or hey, let's let's meet up here. Um, you're right. California was on that list today. It was uh, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, and uh, I think Seattle and Portland, obviously. Well, but uh, look, they're just protesting being alive up there. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> if uh, if your Uber's two minutes late, they're going to burn down the city in, in <laughs> Seattle these days. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a crazy time out there. Uh, what do you say to police officers that are just starting out right now? You were in a whole different atmosphere than when I came on. And mind you, I was in the military in, in the army, and then went into corrections. So I worked at San Quentin. So these different thoughts and processes have gone through but for guys just starting out and first time on the road you're gonna have to deal with a lot boy i would tell you as soon as you can learn crisis intervention training it's being offered all around the united states to officers cit and if you can take a course in active listening skills Mm -hmm. it'll behoove you for everything that you do 
I um, like the word behoove, by the way. That's how I know. I don't need to see your dude DD-214. That's how I knew you were in the <laughs> army back in the day. You know what I mean? Because nobody else on earth uses that fucking word ever, except for dudes that were in the military. That's it. I've been out of the military a long time. I know, but it never leaves your head because you have drill sergeants screaming, it'll behoove you to fucking shut up for months on go. end. There you go. Um, I think is, we are in a whole different realm right, right. now. I'll be honest with you, I would not want to be starting off brand new but then again i wouldn't know what i know now right so yeah i mean it's gonna be it'll be interesting to see how these young folks handle it because they don't like you said they don't know anything else so it'll be uh like i I assume they're they'll adapt because people do adapt regardless of what job or or industry it is or what what kind of person is it people adapt or they go away right so it'll be interesting to see what happens here i think uh anytime you remove uh incentive for doing a job like that, it becomes problematic because it's a tough job, right? People want to know at the end of the day that all the extra hours they're working and the danger they go through is worth it for their family, not just for them. It's not even about them because if it was about them, they wouldn't be doing that job in the f- fucking first place, frankly. Right. They need to know that their family is going to be taken care of. And uh, part of that is money, man. It's, it's just the way it is. And the idea that you're going to defund that means you're going to get less, less and less professional recruits which means you're going to have less and less professional police officers, right? Yeah. That's just how that works. And that's not the solution to this. I mean, how could it be? It, and look what you're going to lose. First, you're going to lose all the outlying community reach resources, and then it's going to work its way in. It's like when you lose weight, you start losing weight at your head and your toes first, and it works into your gut because that's your primary area that you're protecting. So you're going to get rid of all these other things before it actually hits the middle of that police force. The community is going to be, you know, much worse for it. It's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Are uh, you are you still living in California right now? I am looking looking at many other places. <laughs> <laughs> it's really it's really nice in Austin. I'll tell and you. And I that. tell them I'm not coming to change. I'm coming to adapt. I love small towns, so I, I will bring nothing of California here. California is a great place. It's just gone a little haywire. Yeah. The the. California itself is amazing. Yeah. Without all those people there. Without, you know look, I mean? look, the it's, weather is amazing. Uh, look, without all the people, the fires, the taxes, if you live in the where politics, if, if California you, is amazing. If you lived where I lived in Oakland, uptown Oakland, I could get to the mountains and go skiing uh-huh. or the beach or yeah. wine country or the desert all within about four to six hours. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, like, come on, you can't get any better than that. But that's, I mean, people flock there, right? And then, and then Shit once it weird. sets in, it says, uh, what are you, 13.9% tax rate? Um, I don't even so know. Expensive here. Yeah. The taxes are, are really, really sunk. And just, just to register your vehicle, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm paying over 500 bucks a month just to register, or excuse me, 500 bucks a year just to register a car. Ooh, Come on. That's funny. Kidding. I've told this story on the show before, but when I moved from uh, Madison, Wisconsin to Oakland, I just bought a car, and I didn't know this rule. Apparently, this rule exists to keep people from going out of state and buying a car and bringing it back in and not paying sales tax. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Okay. But I didn't live here before. Right. right. I moved here. I just happened to have bought a car three months ago. When I came to California, I had to pay the difference to the DMV and property tax. No way. Our, our sales tax yeah, yeah, from yeah. the car. Well, they consider it your property, and North Carolina yeah. is doing that now, I mean, it's too. Like, it's like, come on, like, man. Yeah. I had to pay, uh, it was $940 to get my like 2010 Ford Escape registered in California. Oof, uh, and that Escape car, is a nice vehicle. Yeah, that's though. like three payments <laughs> for that car. Are you kidding me? Like you said, the weather out here is nice. The, the territory, the terrain is, is beautiful. It is. And like you said, I can go, I can be in Tahoe in three and a half mm-hmm. hours. I can be to the beach in an hour. You know, I, all these different things, but you're going to pay for it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You always do. Exactly. I think one of the reasons you're probably so great at your job is you have a very soothing voice um so when you talk like i i feel safe talking to you and that that doesn't happen to me very much you know what i'm saying i'm a, I'm a large gentleman and uh it it, it takes a, it takes a powerful voice to make me feel safe like this well thank you and and one of my tricks of the trade and, and what i teach is i tend to talk uh, fast too fast a lot of times so i really focus on slowing down when i'm doing these high-end conversations and that seems to help because if you thought, you know, just imagine, for instance, being over that rail and nothing else for 220 feet down, you're probably going to miss a lot of what someone's telling you. So I try to think of that and really slow down my speech uh, so they can comprehend it and, and, and take it all in. So that's kind of what you're doing now. You're running these. One of my buddies, uh, uh, Borland, is uh, involved in CIT up in, I think, in Virginia somewhere. But yeah, they're, they're all over the country now. And it's 
that's one of those things, like you said before, uh, crisis intervention uh, training, where that's the kind of stuff that goes away when you start cutting down the budget of police officers. They're, that, please, ask a police officer how often they've been denied overtime, even though they worked it in mm -hmm. their careers. Like DHS had this problem in 2016. All, all the, uh, so DHS and Secret Service, uh, plain clothes and uh, uh, uniform guys, were doing all this overtime for the election, right? But there's a federal limit on how much money uh, a person can make in the government, right? So they worked all these hours for free, basically, Oof. during that election. And that happens to cops all the time. Like, how, I, I don't even want to ask you how many times you've worked overtime and never been paid for it. But also, uh, it kind of speaks to your value as a human being, in my opinion, because it wasn't just the standing there and being empathetic. It was the follow-up. One of the things you were known for was following up the people the next day. Like, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? Let's go hang out or whatever like that. That's on your own time. You know well, what it's I mean? important. Of course I, it's important. And I would tell them, hey, man, you can come back to this bridge. It's known that if we can get people past this crisis, this particular crisis that they're in immediately right now, mm -hmm. many times it, it'll last anywhere from 30 seconds to several hours. If we can get them past that, a lot of times they won't attempt suicide again. But if they did, it's like, hey, I just want to get you back over here today. Never lying, never, never BSing them. And say, if you come back to the bridge sometime and you're not feeling right and you want to have coffee, man, call the office. They'll get a hold of me. I'll meet you down here. Mm -hmm. What was the longest uh, somebody was on that bridge that you had to sit there and, and, uh, and try to talk them down? The longest one I had was just about eight hours. And it was actually on the west side of the bridge. Oh, really? Um, most, most of these, over 99% are on the east side, mm -hmm. facing the bay towards Alcatraz, yeah. because that's where pedestrians are allowed, is on the east mm -hmm. side to walk across. Anytime you see people walking, they're on that side. But this individual had, had gotten over to the west side, facing out towards the ocean, and that, that's where we conducted this. And it was a, a very long time. As a, the only guy I ever tried to grab, and it didn't work. Because he was out there for so long, he was cold and clammy. Mm. You know that bridge. Anybody that's been on it will tell you it's it gets nasty out there. Very cold. Mm. We get a lot of fog. So I was working with the SO deputy, Marin County SO mm. Sheriff's Office, and we had it in our head. Okay, we're going to reach over and we're going to grab this guy. We reached through the rails and grabbed him, but his skin was so cold and clammy that that it just we just came right off the guy. So he jerked back. He didn't fall. Uh, he did wind up coming back over. But it was about eight hours. Man, that's crazy. That's a long time to, to sit well, out there in that cold. Exhausting. And if he's, in the, if he's on the east side, that means traffic shut down to, to Sausalito and everything, right? I mean, that's a, there's yeah. a lot of traffic going north towards. There is. We're actually on this one. We're on the southbound. Going okay. southbound into the city. So we usually, if you have a car, mm -hmm. we'll take a lane. We try not to block the whole bridge. Right, yeah. So we will take a lane. But when I'm on the motorcycle, then I, then I don't have to. Right. So I can just bridge right down. So the you're the real life chips then. You're, you're Eric Estrada. No, who's the other guy? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. He's better looking than then John. Eric, uh, it's John and Ponch. What is his know? name? Because of the video. Uh, what is his name? John. It's John, it's, John and Ponch, right? Yeah, it's John and Ponch, yeah, brother. Yeah. Who, who is, He's John. What's his real name? Who I don't cares? remember. cares? I don't care what his real name is. Larry Wilcox. That's there it. There it is. Wilcox. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> big, so Wilcox, actually, we're big Wilcox fans. I'm in the Marine area as the motor sergeant. So yeah, that's well, there something go. I always wanted to do, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> How many people, uh, on average, a year attempt uh, suicide on that bridge? You know, I just got some numbers. If I wrote it on here, I'm going to say a, a hundred and over 150 attempts. Wow, a year per, per year. Oh, here we go. Now, let me let me give this to you here. So, 2018, 31 confirmed suicides Fuck. and 187 interventions. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, 200 total then. So, yeah, you're looking at, you know, basically every 2 days somebody's trying to do it uh, off that bridge. It's about um, 16 and a half per month. My god. Which means basically you were you personally at that time were interdicting a quarter of those people, which makes sense, I guess. Well, because you back were working then, this when morning, I was right? doing this prior to 9 11, the tragedy in 9 11, we only had one officer working down there. Right. So now we have more. After that tragedy, we put some more folks on there. We actually have people on bicycles down there. By the way, they're the JV squad. Motor, motors are the way to go. <laughs> JV squad. Got to put that in there. Yeah, of yeah. course. But then, but then the Golden Gate Bridge hired security guards, and most mm. of them do a very, very good job, too. God, I mean, that's a high-stress environment right there, for sure. So, 
I'm going to, I'm going to ask a crazy question. Has anybody survived it? Yes, there have been a few people. Um, are they and- fucked up? Like, is it, how, how bad is it? Like 220 feet is how bad it is. It's like you're, you're it's basically concrete 75 miles an hour. So, <sighs> Oh my God. Did, did anybody just walk away from it and no, just start swimming no away? And they're like, Oh man, you hit the perfect trajectory or, you know, things like that. I always think about it when I'm on a bridge of like, ah, I could make this. People have jumped and they, there was a 14 year old kid several years ago that did it on a dare when he's out on a class outing. Mm-hmm. Oh, I hate Imagine doing that on a dare. No, and I've got two boys right now. Um, yes, and, uh, I have two boys also. And, you know, it's brutal. You're going to get injured. You will get injured. And, and uh, you know, and I have seen, because, of course, getting into this type of work, you're not going to be able to help everybody. And I've had people jump on me. And I've seen them hit. And when all the, the water clears and all the, the white foam goes away, they come up. And sometimes they're still alive. But then, because all the water coming at them and they break bones, then, then they drown. Right. Yeah, well, there was that did, one guy. Did, did the 14-year-old live? He did. That's but he good. was messed up. Well, you know, of course, he, yeah. Um, I, there was that one guy. Little, and, we've got to get to folks long before they get to that bridge. We really do. For sure, yeah. There, we are doing it, but we're losing still in this country of over 48,000 people a year. So Right. Well, I mean, if, if police officers are the ones that are interdicting those things, then it's too late at that point. In my opinion, I mean, it's not too late. Obviously, you guys have had great success, but for the process to be working correctly, that's way too late in the process for the actual action to be happening. Um, exactly. Couldn't say that better. Yeah. You, that's perfect. I want to tape record that and put that into my talk. Well, it'll be on YouTube tonight, so you, you can scrap <laughs> it. <laughs> um, but, but it's right. It is. Yeah. And then it's like when I talk to when I do presentations, I tell them when these folks are over the rail, man, this is this is way late in the process. We need to get to them long before they get up to this stage four cancer of a bridge at times. Right. That's exactly what I say. And if you've ever studied, uh, like if you've ever done any kind of security work or military work at all, or if you've ever done any kind of like micro expression analysis, you understand that emotions don't just happen. They build slowly. It may seem like they happen really quickly. Right. But even with anger, there's like, there's three or four different uh like pre-fight indicators usually that you can see on people, clenched hands, taking an aggressive posture, their eyes widen, they start to sweat. There's all kinds of different things you can see Mm -hmm. that happen before somebody's about to do something violent. You know what I mean? Particularly something that's unexpectedly violent. Um, Now, it's the same thing with uh, any psychological principle. And there are signs for each one of these people. People become adept at hiding it, but almost everyone I've ever heard of that killed themselves that I knew personally and, and between Jared and I and some of our other friends, we've got, you know, probably in total at this point, two dozen friends that have killed themselves uh, amongst us, amongst our little group. And looking back on it in retrospect, you can always see the signs. Like if you look at it then, and we're not good at recognizing those signs. And I think among, and especially in the veteran community, I think we're afraid to face that demon on our own sometimes. So going out and helping somebody else with it, like exposes us to what he was talking about before the trigger. You know what I mean? Like maybe seeing him again, somebody that he helped get off the bridge sees him again. And it reminds him of that day and they go into a spiral. Right. Right. I think a lot of veterans are afraid of that. Frankly, I don't think anybody's talking about that shit. Like I, I feel like people are, are desperate to avoid thinking about that. Yeah. And I've, I've had uh, eight friends of mine uh, that I personally knew die um, all by the same manner of suicide of hanging for some reason. Um, and I, I, I don't know why, uh, a friend of mine was trying to, uh, look into it and, and they, he was doing some studies. Um, maybe it was the age, uh, it seems to be this mid thirties, late thirties, uh, age that, uh, that they're doing it. Um, a, a lot of them had young kids, which mm-hmm. was surprising. Um, and they were just okay leaving their families. Um, in your experience, is there an age range or, or, or a job or something you can look for where you're like, these people are more susceptible. I mean, obviously, military veterans. Um, well, men, men in general have a much higher frequency of suicide than women do. Why, why is that, you think? White, white males is the typical yeah. one out of the whole thing. And then it varies from year to year, but generally 49 to 51% use, use a weapon. Mm. Guns are a big deal. Mm. And I would never advocate anything with the Second Amendment. Come on. I'm looking to buy some new guns. Yeah, of course. Well, you got to get out of California for Well, no, you got the, C, the what is it? The CR, not CR, it's uh, HR 218 or whatever. You can carry a gun anywhere you want for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right. I think I can now own a squirt gun with lemonade in it. Oh, shit. Well, 
That's uh, that's an advancement. Yeah, you gotta get one of those uh, those flamethrowers that Elon Musk sells. That's what you really need. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> not a flamethrower. Absolutely. Yeah, not a, it's called not a flamethrower, by the way, for legal yeah. purposes. Obviously. For legal purposes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so white males. That's that's uh, yeah. that's the that's the group. What about the age range? And you know, typically forty five ish. In that, we are seeing a lot more seniors, and we are seeing a lot more kids, adolescents. Hmm. Because of the social media. Social media, yeah. I just watched a, a documentary called The Social Dilemma on Netflix, and I would highly recommend it. And there was a scene where a girl uh, was, maybe she looked like she was 12 years old on Instagram. She's going through filters, trying to make herself look perfect. And then the comments start rolling in where her ears were sticking out from behind her hair, and they were calling her Dumbo and other things. And like, yeah, I, I was going to ask you about that because social media, the pressure now for kids, um, and, and in particular the comments, um, that makes sense to me where that number is getting higher because, uh, look, man, we didn't have to do that when we were growing up, Dan. I mean, I can't imagine going through it now. Um, well, I mean, we, we didn't because we're not in one of those demographics that typically gets picked on. You know what I mean? And that's something that I was keenly aware of because I come from an abusive household. So I w when I went to school, I was keenly aware of that. Like you could see the signs of somebody that's not doing well because other people are not treating them well when you've been through shit like that before. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that, that, still to this day is one of the things that makes me the most angry. Uh, people preying on... So the reason I joined the military in the first place, anybody preying on somebody weaker than them, you're a piece of shit, and I'm going to come get you. You know what yeah. I mean? And that's just how I always thought about it. And then the, you know, 9-11 happened. I'm like, oh, shit, well, here's my opportunity to do that in a real way. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't really work out that way because of politics and all that shit. But, I mean, you know, that's the fundamental drive for a lot of people. And I think it's... When, when we, in society, we're talking about toxic masculinity all the time. That is real masculinity, is, is using your strength to protect other people, right? Whether yeah. it be intellectual strength or empathy, there's a lot of different types of strength. It's not all fucking biceps and fucking quads and shit. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Mostly what strength is, is the will to put other people in front of you. Yeah, is that what made you want to join the military? Right. Right out of high school. Didn't know what I wanted to do, but... After doing a bunch of research, I go, you know what? This looks really cool. This looks like something I would. And I actually thought about staying in and and going to college during that time and being an officer. But um, when I was in Germany in '83, I was diagnosed with cancer, testicular cancer. So shit. God, how how old were you then? I was 20 years old. Oh they shit! Back, landed back at SF or not at SFO, but at Travis Air Force mm. Base uh, on December 5th, my birthday. So. My big thought was landing here on my birthday, turned 21 at Travis Air Force Base. And I thought, you know, well, at least if I die, then I, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm home. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly you survived, and obviously your boys survived because uh, you got two kids um, right. out of it. Uh, man, what's that like at 20 years old? Testicular cancer. Oh, and back then, this was 1983. Nobody talked about it. We didn't talk about cancer much. Testicular yeah. cancer? I never told anybody about it for decades. I told them I had stomach cancer because I got a big scar in my abdomen, mm. stern all the way down, sternum all the way down. And it was from a lymphadectomy where they take out lymph nodes and they took out over 40 of mine and over 35 of those were cancerous. So I wow. would just tell people I had stomach cancer because it's a big hit on your manhood, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. But as going through depression and heart issues and, and head issues, um, hitting the head type of things. You know, I went through all this stuff. And then finally, I just came out and said everything when I started talking. I want to give people the truth. This is what happened to me. And this is how depression hit me. And I'm the guy that was in the military, worked at San Quentin, was a motor cop, did all this stuff. We never showed a weakness. And because I didn't and talk about it, boy, did I suffer. That, that had to have helped you on the job, though. Um, going through it yourself and going through that type of depression, that had to have helped you once you got in that position to help other people who are depressed. I think it did, but I, I didn't compare situations because I, I didn't want to do that. Mm. I don't think it's right because every time I talk to someone, it's always about them. And even though I had all these things that I was involved in, I didn't bring that up because I'm, I wanted to make sure this was not the Kevin Briggs show. It's about that individual. But if they said something like, you don't know what it's like to have cancer. Well, I do. And I will tell you many, many times, commonalities create comfort. So we can talk about that. And then the more we can chat and the longer we can stretch this out, the better chance I have of influencing that behavioral change. 
Yeah, and that's why I asked because you know Dan and I do that in podcasts all the time where we try to find uh, some commonalities with people. Right. Um, some people are afraid to open up. You're not at all. Uh, you're one. You're one of the best in the biz. I'm surprised you don't have a podcast. <laughs> I, they keep pushing me, but I. I'm better on this side of it. <laughs> I, I know my limits. Well, you just need a good host then, and you're the you're the color yeah. guy. That's what you need. Yeah. Are you a sports fan living up uh, by San Fran? I am. Mm. I, hope- I, I, I don't like what's going on right now, I will tell you. Uh, who, who's your team? Is it, uh, are, were you a Raiders or a 49ers you know, guy? I was the Raiders when I was growing up, but I changed over to the Niners. But back in the day, it certainly was the Raiders. Um, might be time to switch back. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might be time to switch back. I mean, the uh, Raiders are in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. They played in the right. new stadium last night, but uh, the 49ers lost everyone in yeah. their last game. Uh, Garoppolo's yeah. down. Bosa's he might, he out. might come back this week, but Mostert, Mostert and Bosa are probably out for the year, yeah. I think. Yeah, I don't think they're getting back to the Super Bowl at all. What about baseball? Are you a Giants fan? Or an A's fan? Well, I do like the Giants. Mm. I did go to a number of A's games a few years back. But, man, things have gone just a different path with sports guys. I wish <laughs> they could get away from the politics and all the nonsense and just get back to playing the game. Yeah, it's true. One of our good buddies, Aubrey Huff, who I'm sure you're familiar with, he's, he's been on the show a bunch of times. He, he says the same thing. Like, he's personally a very conservative guy. But he always, whenever anybody is talking about politics as an at, like a current athlete, he's like, why are you talking about this? Talk about yeah. the game that yeah. just happened. Yeah. Like, yeah, on your off time, maybe, maybe go to help some people and just keep your mouth shut about it because that's what real help is. You're not just trying to chase clout. I yeah, guess. I don't know. it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to happen. I mean, even in the game last night, because um, I was watching the Raiders last night, just mm-hmm. curious to see what their new stadium was like. It's in all the end zones, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And, ra- yeah. and racism and everything else. And you're just like, all right, cool, I mean, man. that's the, my, my real problem with that is not the words on the pitch or the, the field. It's the fact that it's a platitude. It's right. meaningless. Right. What does that mean? End racism. Yeah. Like that would be like him just wearing a t-shirt all these years that said end suicide, but he never actually talked to anybody. Sure. You know what I mean? It's nonsense. It's absolutely it cost you zero dollars and zero effort to do that. And to me, that's meaningless. And it's not just meaningless. You're a major organization. If you really wanted to do something about this issue, you could, you really could, you could use your money, your $15 billion a year in profit that is untaxed, by the way, you could use that money to start fucking businesses and, and get careers and education for people that need it to get themselves out of poverty because we know that's the number one predictor of crime. You could do that instead of fucking just sitting outside talking about it all the time and putting it on the field and wearing people's names on your hat. Like, that's not the way to solve it. We've, we've yeah, shown that. Yeah, but everybody thinks that it is, and that's the problem. No, they don't. Gonna... They don't think that's the way to solve it. They think that's the way to capitalize on it. That's the problem. I, I, you wonder, right? I know for a fact that is. They're either really stupid because these I, answers are very simple. I or lean towards stupid. They may be very stupid, <laughs> but the people, the people in power are not stupid. They know exactly what they're doing. These politicians know exactly what they're doing. These CEOs and all these other stuff that are trying to capitalize it, they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Of course they do. It, they, all they do is market their product for a living. They know exactly what they're doing. I know, and right now we've got to market our products for a living because we get some sponsors who pay for the show to be on the air, and I apologize. Uh, first and foremost is ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Best in the biz, D'Anthony. It is, yeah. Uh, 30% off if you're a member of the military, a first responder, a teacher, or work in the government. Um, if you're a regular dum dum like myself, you get 25% off. And uh, right now, you get two free pillows when you order a mattress at ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Uh, as always, they've got a 36 month page to go program, no interest at ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. So you can go ahead and skate on over there and get yourself a nice mattress. Yeah, for like 30 bucks. A month basically. It's great. I mean, it's ridiculous how it's cheap great. it is. Yeah. I, I've never seen a company do three years. Like, there are furniture companies that did it back in the day because their volume is so high that that makes sense for them and mm-hmm. a lifetime value of a customer because usually the customers come back and buy more stuff later. I get it. And I'm jealous, but it's definitely the same. And I know that for a fact because I've purchased several of them now oh, yeah. and a bunch of pillows and an adjustable base and then a headboard. And like, I, I've bought so much shit from them. So I, it's definitely true. Yeah. But I've never seen a company go three years with no interest. Crazy. For, for something that costs like 800 to 1500 bucks. How do they, That's know, the, how do they know the credit scores? You know what I'm saying? Uh, there's an app that does all of it now. Is there really? Yes, dude. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Next up, we got buyraycon.com forward oh. slash. Drinking bros. Those new, look, I Ooh. like, you know, I'm one of the few adult men that can wear white 
tennis shoe sneakers yes. without getting them dirty. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty successful at it. I love the how it pops. The new white E twenty fives are they look great. They're sleek. Best They're very pretty in the biz. They're also as far as loud. Wireless headphones yeah. go. Um, I'm sure you're you're listening to a lot of uh, Cardi B these days. Mm. Um, if you are, um, look. Are you talking I, about Sergeant Briggs or the yeah, community at large? Sergeant Briggs. Sure. <laughs> Sergeant Briggs. I'm looking at I you, hate my man. Music, okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you. I know you've got WAP on repeat. Yep. Uh, in oh, your Raycon headphones, and uh, these are the best in the biz. Wireless. Uh, mm. They charge and they last up to six hours. In a little tiny case. About as big as my uh, this keychain right here. It is, yeah. That's all it is. It's um, it's smaller than the uh, cases of the competitors for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's it's way smaller, and the charge is actually an hour longer than everybody else. I don't know how they did that. Probably Ray J is working his magic on stuff. Who knows? I think he might be a wizard. I, it could be. What I know is you can go to Raycon, buyraycon.com forward slash drinking bros today, and uh, you get 15% off, knocks it down to about 65 bucks. That is the best price you will find for wireless headphones. You need to go and get these things today. That is buyraycon.com forward slash drinking bros. Last but not least, who do we got, Dan? Oh, we got Duke Cannon. They've got some new stuff going yeah, on, Yeah, they do. Duke Cannon has got a pumpkin spice soap oh, yeah. uh, right now because today is the first day of fall. Dan <laughs> yeah, they sent, they sent some to us. Yeah. I haven't got it yet. And it smell, I have got it in my house. Oh. It smells delightful. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this. It is the best scent uh, on a man's body that will attract strange women. Are you married, uh, Mr. Briggs? A uh, girlfriend of, of, of a very long time. There we go. Yeah. How old is she? 28, 29? <laughs> Just a little bit up. Not much. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Not much. You're damn right. What did she Oh, She'll kill me. If I tell you. No, <laughs> I'm 57. She's 45. She's on the patrol, actually. Oh, she's still active? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good she has her. four years left. She's a sergeant. Nice. Wow. Two sergeants in the same family. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, Duke Cannon loves uh, first responders and military. They do. Uh, they do. Big they uh, they donate uh, some of their proceeds at the end of the year to them uh, yeah, every single year. But if you put this pumpkin spice on your body, yeah, when the lady comes home, when the missus comes home, it's, uh, it's, it's fall season. Nothing attracts the ladies more yeah. than a little pumpkin spice. And they've also got it. this. Uh, they're, they're building kits on there now, mm -hmm. which is what I like because I like it's, it's all scents for different types of products that all go together, yep. like from hair stuff to like solid cologne to the soap, everything else. Yeah. This one's called Frontier 40, and it's like an outdoorsy kind of dude thing. You get four big-ass bricks of soap. It's a big-ass brick of soap. Yep. And I'm not editorializing. That is the name of the product. That is the name of the product, okay. and it goes in a sleeve, too, so you can just wash oh, yourself, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's the best. Uh, then you get uh, four, it's four different scents in there. It's... Uh, Campfire, fresh cut pine, leaf and leather, and midnight swim. And the purpose of this is to get you interested in the product, right? Yeah. Not not interested in the product. It's to, to introduce you to the product so you know which one of those flavors you like. Yeah. And you start buying that, right? Because they have subscription services just like Black Rifle does and all this other shit. Speaking of Black Rifle, whenever I looked at Duke Cannon's, uh, their board to see who all, they, uh, who all their charity stuff is with, mm -hmm. it's like... Them and Black Rifle, them and Black Rifle, them and Black yeah. Rifle all the time. Yeah, yeah. Like they're they're involved in so much of the same stuff. I can't believe we haven't met them until this past year. Me neither. We we just had the CEO on, great guy. Yeah. Um, and they, that's the best uh, body wash and soap on the planet. You guys were the ones that actually uh, hit us up and asked them to to be a sponsor. Yep. Uh, they were grateful enough and uh, agreed to it. So you can go to DukeCannon.com. It's a new code. code uh, it's Drinking Bros Ten now. Drinking Bros Ten. Ten percent off, and you get free shipping on any order over twenty bucks as well. All your orders are going to be over twenty bucks. So, correct correct uh, and uh you can also go to target if you if you can't if you don't buy stuff uh, online i would recommend getting it shipped to your house shipped to your house because when it comes from there it's fresher yeah like, to be honest and you're talking about like soap has fat in it i don't know if you know how it's live and yeah. fat right yeah, yeah. Uh, you, we've seen all seen fight, fight club, club right yeah. yeah so there's there's fat in it there's a shelf life to soap Mm -hmm. Right, so you want to get it directly from the source. That's what I do. I don't. I don't ever buy it in the store anymore. Me neither. Get it shipped to your house. DukeCannon.com. Drinking Bros. Ten. Is that ten percent off? What do yep. we got there? Ten percent off and free shipping over twenty free bucks. Free shipping over twenty bucks. Um, so you're married to a sergeant. Uh, that's crazy. Did you guys meet on the job? And do you guys call each other sergeant? Yeah, sergeant, <laughs> sergeant. Depends on where we are. Oh shit. Ooh. And this got real sexy over here. Yeah, it did. Uh, do, do, does it get crazy when, when cops are dating other cops? Like, do the handcuffs come no, out? I would have never, never. It, it kind of broke all my rules of dating another cop. Don't ever do that. I, you know, I would tell myself, oh, 
through through my process of, of law enforcement, but I did. It's been quite a number of years now. Um, we're still boyfriend, girlfriend, but we lived together, lived together for, for a long time. So everything's going smooth. You know, she talks about marriage once in a while. Um, I go, is, well, is there, a, is there a tax deal with this or... Yeah, yeah. Well, bones here. What's what's going well, on? Well, but her well, retirement becomes your retirement. That's so true. Why, why yeah. not just go ahead and pop the question? But in California, you have to be married for ten years to get access to the any retirement or pension stuff. By the way, I'm just saying. Just I I learned this when Kobe fucking cheated on his wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Right. Um, how long you guys been together? I'm more than ten. Well, more than. Uh, then you're. That's it. That's it. It's common law at that point, right? So, I don't think California has common law marriage, do they? Well, we did do that domestic partnership. Deal. Oh, that's true. Yeah, ah, you can do that. California thing. It's yeah. all. Uh, it's a mess. And then, you but, know they're going to tax you for the next ten years after you move too. So get ready for that. There's yeah. no getting out of this year. I'm stuck. <laughs> it's not. I'm stuck in the relationship. Stuck in the taxes. Yeah, yeah. Stuck in the taxes. Um. So are you fully retired right now are you, or, or do you work uh, another, another job right now? I do a couple of things. I mentor at my local schools. So I do that. And then I have my own business, Pivotal Points, to where I travel and, and do presentations on mental health, quality of life, negotiating skills, and, and stuff like this. You're a better human than Dan and I. Um, mm. And we need this. Like once a week, we, need to, we, need, we chat with people like yourself uh, to, to help us feel better. Because you're talking to a couple of dirt bags right mm. now. Um, and we're, we're grateful that you're on the show and, and put up with these sh- I appreciate it. shenanigans. You, it you really did. You make it easy. Well, <laughs> where, where do you go and speak at? Do you go to high schools and things like that? I go to high schools. I just did this big company in England. Uh, we, we did it, of course, virtual, but Moody's. Mm, oh, Moody's, yeah. 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 They're, they're the actually Moody's? speaking of, uh, so like in, in, a, in the United States, and England, the same thing is prevalent. About 68 to 70% of all suicides are white males of varying ages, right? It's the same thing in England for some reason. I mean, I guess we're from the same generic or same general gene pools for the most part. Yeah, I thought England was just all white people, is it not? No. Huh? A lot of, uh, a lot of folks there. Learn something yeah. new every day. Don't At any rate, yeah. You know? I mean, they have a big problem with suicide as well. And it's, you know... It's interesting that they hired an American to come over there and, and speak about this issue. Yeah, why do you think that is? It, you know what? They, maybe they just saw other work that I did and knew I would be speaking mm-hmm. about it. So they reached out. And then uh, last week I was in, in Washington, D.C. I went to the FBI headquarters and I did uh, two college campuses online. So it, oh, and last week, it's a lot of fun. I did uh, several Jewish community centers. Mm-hmm. A lot of fun. Really cool. Yeah, I used, to, I used to do security for a lot of those around actually this time of year because uh, it's uh, the high holy holidays are happening right mm-hmm. now, right? So it's like every September I was down in uh, like Palo Alto at these big giant Jewish community centers walking around with an assault rifle everywhere, right? No kidding. Yeah, because they were super worried about getting attacked, obviously, because people yeah. were crazy. Yeah, yeah, people, uh, people yeah. are crazy. Um, man, what, what an amazing life you've led. Uh, that's, it's... It's pretty incredible that you do this um, for yeah. a living because I, mean, I just think, of, not, yeah, so. but I think of how many lives you've actually touched and it's, it's rare, man. I mean, it's rare that you meet somebody who's uh, um, doing this for a living and, uh, and you're truly helping people uh, literally all over the world. It's been very humbling, very satisfying, but also very humbling, but also you see people in some of their darkest times and it breaks your heart too, so. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, what about your children? Are they in, in college? Are they all grown up now? Both of them. One's high school. Okay. And then the other one um, is in college right now, too. He's 17 and 19, two boys. What would you tell your boys? Because I've got two boys. What would you tell them if, if they wanted to, to become police officers? Hmm. That's a tough one. Right? I, don't, I, I'd, I would, if they really wanted to, okay. We're going to talk for a while. Let me show you what it's like. And then we're going to go talk to some of my friends who are still on the job. There's a lot of easier ways to make a buck and, it, and realize that you probably have a much better chance of coming home. Yeah, but there's no chance, regardless of what the circumstances were at any point, that you were going to be anything other than a cop and exactly the kind of cop that you were, frankly. Like some people are just cut out for the shit that they do. And there's nothing you I could like do. With, I yeah, I like what I do. I mean, there's, there's no version of you. I can't imagine a version of you that isn't doing this. So... 
maybe one of them's like that. But if they're just doing it because you did it, that's the wrong answer today, right? Find something you like. Yeah. I've never said, man, I don't care if you, whatever it is, you know, whatever you want to just, mm. just work hard and be good at it. There's so many people out there that are just getting by and trying to work the system and get everything for free. I'm so against that work hard, whatever I get, even if one of my boys, he wants to play professional soccer. Mm. I said, man, if you get out there and you make it fantastic, I'm going to support you all the way. If you go over to England, he's been looking at Spain and different places. Mm. Uh -huh. I got to want anything from me. If you make billions, I don't care. I don't want a dime. If I can't get it myself, then I'm not going to get it. And that's what I want my boys to take work hard and, you know, get what you can get. Does he have the talent for it? I'm currently coaching my son's soccer team right now. And I can tell you, unequivocally he does not have the talent to do that and if he came to me and said dad i want to play soccer overseas i would say son you couldn't play the in the mls over here today you were that terrible at soccer and you've got to choose something else i love you with all my heart but you were awful at this uh are, are you that type of dad would you tell your kids that this guy's pretty good. I would tell you he's been to China playing soccer. He's been playing soccer uh, for many, many years. He was actually accepted into UC Davis for Division One soccer. Mm. Oh, oh, there you go. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, my kid definitely won't do that. He's um, five. <laughs> he's five. He's five he's years old. He's six, but you know. I'm telling you, you know. I've coached for two years now. I've been a soccer coach for two years. It's my second year in a row. And it's great because it's exercise. So what, all of a sudden you're Bill Belichick of soccer? You know that this five-year-old or six-year-old is not going to be no way. I don't know if you heard this story. Have you coached your kids? No, not for soccer. I didn't know anything about soccer. Okay, but have you coached him in any other sport? Um, not as the coach, but but as a dad. Gotcha. So sure. I coached my kids' uh, soccer teams the last two years, right? I, I not to brag um, and not to pat myself on <laughs> the back, which I'm going to. No, no, no big deal. I guided them with my uh, my coaching skills all the way to the championship game. And I looked at myself as a young Urban Meyer. Who's the soccer coach over there, Giorgio? That's the most famous. Yeah, who? It was probably Arson Winger before, but he's he's retired now. Sure, I looked at myself as a young Arson Winger and uh, guided them all the way to the championship. When I lost, I was devastated. Um, at a five-year-old soccer championship, mm -hmm. like I was, I, I felt like I had let the whole team down. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it was about me. Um, but I will say this: because if you think it's not the other coach from the other team who came up to me during the trophy ceremony. Mm -hmm. He was like, man, I'm going to have the best weekend ever. <laughs> like, wow. Whispered it right in my ear. And it was a nice moment between dads where you're, you're, you're laughing about that stuff. Um, but we were able to, to sit down and have an honest conversation after that of like, do you think any of these kids will make it? Because the parents come up and they tell you, you know, my kid is great or he should be playing more and blah, 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 blah. And you're like, dude, there's six years old like no they're not they're not that great and none of them are going to be professional soccer players you can tell i think when you see certain kids play sports if they're going to be great i can think i think you can tell if they're going to be able or not <laughs> but not necessarily if they're going to be great like muscles no. develop differently for people over time but hand-eye coordination in uh soccer is a big thing yes if they don't have that then i don't know if you can really train that to be honest no no so needless to say my kid's not gonna be playing but if yours is going to uc davis on a, on a soccer scholarship that's great then he's got a shot at it we'll see we'll see you know one of his coaches who was a brutal coach but very he loved the kids but he trained them hard he said you won't find a kid in marin that's going to make it because they don't have the drive and desire like they do in, in Mexico or some other place, mm. you know, because Marin, man, is very, very wealthy, except for me. <laughs> there's a lot of money here. And these kids, they don't have the drive that they would need. You but, know, you that, know it's true. I encourage them to do it, man. You do whatever you want to do as long as it's legal. Yeah. And keep going. Drive on. Well, I will say this, like, it, it's not like you were a prince or something like that, right? So they, they at least grew up with parents who were hardworking. Wait, do you mean prince, the song, singer songwriter or a prince? Like either or is fine. Yeah. Uh, two princes here before you. Um, mm. That's what I said. Now you can use any of those princes as examples. But what I'm saying is uh, when you're a hardworking guy, mm. uh, you know, first responder, a cop, like there's a better shot that he'll have a better work ethic than the rest of those kids up there. Um, I, I, I've got some relatives up around that area, so I know what you're talking about. They're all lazy as shit up there. There's, there is uh, some of that. But there's some <laughs> folks that are very, very wealthy and that gets passed on to the kids. There's a whole ton of entitlement here. Mm. 
Yeah, drinking wine at a young age, like little Frenchies. Affluenza, they call yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a real thing. That's what they said about that kid from Stanford that, uh, like, he got off a sexual assault charge because he had affluenza. Like, his parents didn't raise him right. He was, they were too rich to raise him properly, so he gets a pass. That was kind of the... I understand it. When you're eating lobster all day and drinking champagne, you don't really have time to raise your kids properly. Oh, yeah. Because it's about you at that point. So... Um, <laughs> You know, well, we don't have that here. <laughs> <laughs> no, we ate uh, Kraft mac and cheese out of the box. We didn't even put water. In it. We just ate it straight out of the box. Yeah. Why That's, not? It's the best way to eat it. It's the it, best way. To I eat agree. It. I like the crunch. Yeah. Um, so uh, after your uh, wife retires, <laughs> is that where you guys are going to get on, get on down the road and get out of there? Oh, Girlfriend. Girlfriend. I got to see what's going on with the boys, but we've been looking. Um, I want to get into hunting and fishing a little more. I used to do a lot of it. I'm actually going deer hunting next week, even though California is on fire. We have some private property we got access to. So I want to get more into that. But got to make sure to see what's going on with the boys. You know what we should do? We should bring you out to Crash Landing Outdoors. Our buddy, Archie Bradley, he's the closer for the Cincinnati Reds now. He was the closer for the Diamondbacks. But here in Oklahoma, or just north of here in Oklahoma, he's got a place called Crash Landing Outdoors. And he takes like veterans, first responders out into the woods and hunts with them and shit. He's a, he, I mean, it's, it's, we haven't got a chance to go up there yet because of all this stupid nonsense that's going on. Yeah. We'll, we'll be up there this fall. As soon as baseball season is over, we'll be up there. Yeah. Very- and the, one thing about those fires is, uh, you know, boom, as soon as you kill it, you're cooking it, you know, seconds later. Yeah. So um, you're, you're able to eat it pretty quickly, one, one would imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this, now's the point in the show we get to the drinking bro of the week, uh, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you to become the person you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? You know, I'm going to say the guy who, who is kind of motiv- motivated me to do this. A lot of times it's Kevin Berthea. Have you seen the picture of the guy over the rail? Yeah. Yeah. He, and you, you went on, he's, uh, he lives in Memphis or something, or you guys were in Memphis or something like that, right? Like doing we some kind of presentation. We've done some talks together. Yeah. So Kevin Berthea, who's who, who's who I'm going to, I'm going to talk about. And, you know, he was over the rail, darkest day of his life. And like I do with everybody, I asked him when he came back over that rail, what did I do that was good, man? What did I do that helped the situation? And what did I do that wasn't so good? And all he says was, you listened, you let me speak and you listened. And that's what we've been talking about this whole time, getting to somebody before they get up there. So, you know, he's an inspiration to a lot of people, including myself. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, Giorgio, if you wouldn't mind popping up a picture of him, that would be great. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll put that on screen there. Yeah. Um, and if you search, uh, <clears throat> if you search Google for Kevin Briggs and, uh, Kevin Berthea, you'll find some talks that each one of them have done and ones mm-hmm. they've done together and stuff like that. Like he's got a Ted talk with almost 7 million views at this point. Um, really? Yeah. And it's funny that I don't, I never meet anybody that knows who you are. I'm like, you've heard of this guy, right? And they're like, I don't think so. I'm like, this but, is but like, they all know that picture. They all know that picture. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's gotta be strange. So uh, before we, uh, we let you get out of here, if, if someone in, is at home um, who is thinking about committing suicide, uh, what, what is your best advice uh, for, for them to, uh, to, to do at a moment like this? You know, if they're really contemplating it, please seek help. There's a lot of things going on in your head. I understand it. If you need some assistance, call 1-800-273-TALK. That's National Suicide Prevention it's Lifeline. 8255, I believe, is the number. Right. Yep. And then a lot of adolescents, we know they don't like to talk on the phone but they'll text. So there's a crisis text line, 741-741. Or if you know somebody who's suicidal, you can use those also. Not, they're not there just for the folks who are suicidal. You can call them and get some information. That's awesome. And, uh, and if you're out there, if you're a listener um, or, or a fan of uh, Dan and Jared and Eyes or Matt and Evan, um, uh, that's why Drinking Bros uh, podcast and the community was created was so that you would never drink alone. Uh, Jared Taylor uh, initially founded all of this um, because, uh, you know, 22 um, veterans were, were uh, committing suicide mm-hmm. per day. And he wanted a place where uh, no matter where you were, whatever city in the United States, you could find someone who was in your community to talk to and have a drink with. Um, so feel free to join uh, Drinking Bros. Uh, just drinking bros, uh, the community on, uh, mm-hmm. on Facebook, it is a private group. So whatever you say in there, um, whether you, be public. Yeah, whether you listen to the show or not, if this is the first time you ever listened and you never plan on listening again, I would recommend going to that group. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, almost every city is represented in the United States. We've got over 800 subgroups. Mm -hmm. So you can find the city that you're in. Uh, we're in Austin, Texas. Uh, Dan and I are both in that group as well. But uh, if you look, if you're in California or, or Marin County, you can, you can find somebody that is close uh, by you. And uh, they'll be more than happy to sit with you, uh, uh, even if you don't drink, and, uh, and just hear your stories and, and tell you why you should live. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time today and you being on the show. Again, it is unbelievably uh, rare that we get to just shout out people's names on the show and then they show up right. a few weeks later. Um, that is one of the, the, the true gifts of this job is uh, that we get to sit down with, with, with men like you. Um, you're an inspiring guy and uh, we, we greatly appreciate your time tonight. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for having me and thank you for everything you're doing absolutely spectacular what you folks are doing highly appreciate it uh i will steer more people your direction hey thank you thank you very much um for d'anthony d'anthony holloway i'm ross patterson we are the drinking bros good night everyone <laughs>